Today, if you've got your Bibles, open to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 4. Uh, uh, we took a break from going verse by verse through a couple of different books of the Bible uh, to talk about our vision statement over the last uh, month or month and a half, or two months. Uh, we're getting back to Philippians chapter 3. And, you know, as I was looking at this, uh, I kind of laughed because I, I made a few little modifications, kind of things, that I, illustrations, I guess, that I was going to be using today and, uh, to kind of deal with more current issues. Uh, but uh, those of you that many of you know, I write my sermons long in advance. And uh, I was looking back at this one this week and started <coughs> looking at it and thinking, you know, with just a few very minor modifications, I think it says something to us that we need to hear. Uh, and it says something, maybe it says something to me that I need to hear. Uh, because as I was uh, watching and reading Facebook this week, one of the things that, that kind of jumped out at me, you know, was seeing all these churches that were, were canceling, and, and there was a part of me that was going, we're not going to cancel. We're not going to do that. And, and started to have a little bit of pride in myself that, no, we're not going to do that. And, you know, I had to begin to, to take some time and ask myself, Am I not canceling because of personal pride? Or am I not canceling because I feel like this is God is saying, I want y'all to meet together for worship? And I will say, because we are sitting here, seated here today, I think I came to the answer that we're going to meet because I think it's what God wanted us to do. Now, the answer might change next Sunday. It might. And... Man, I covet your prayers uh, for, for all of us, uh, for all of leaders, uh, city leaders, county, na state, nation, all of them that are having to make decisions. You know, many times if you're making a decision on, on information that you have and that you know, that you hope is correct, you hope it's the right thing, and, and in the end, you have to make a decision and say, we're going to go with this. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, it may change. But today we're talking out of Philippians. I saw this quote uh, from G. Gordon Liddy. And if you are below my age, uh, and even my age, they say my age and below, uh, you may hear the name G. Gordon Liddy or George Gordon Liddy and go, who in the world is that? Uh, if you are much older than me, that name is probably familiar to you because he was part of the Watergate scandal. And uh, he said this <clears throat> before he went into prison. He said, I have found within myself all I need and all I ever shall need. I am a man of great faith, but my faith is in George Gordon Liddy. I have never failed me. Well, he later found out that George Gordon Liddy had failed him and would fail him. You know, when we become proud of our own ability and we trust in that ability to accomplish the most important objectives in life, we begin trusting in something that will always fail us. In this passage in Philippians, Paul talks about his own heritage, and then he really comes to a realization about his own heritage. Paul had a lot to be proud of. We're going to read that in just a second. We're going to talk about it. He had a lot to be proud of, but he began to recognize something about that that was a very important lesson for all of us to learn. Again, Philippians chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 4. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But... Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, 
and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining for, toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Paul kind of lays out two resumes here. He, he lays out his, his human work resume, and then he's going to lay out his God-focused resume. You know, when you're applying for a job, I remember in seminary, uh, one of the advice, words of advice that our, a professor gave to us about your resume in church resumes, uh, it's very odd, typically you put a picture of yourself on there. And one of our professors was talking to us, and uh, he said, now listen, I just want to give you a word of advice. If you have a really good looking wife, make sure you put a picture of her and you on your resume. And so, you know, now as I have gone through and gone through a couple of searches on different people, you know, looking for different positions, I'll be honest, I always look and go, is there a picture of the wife on the resume? And, and I kind of wonder about the guys that don't have a picture of their wife on their resume. Just for information, every resume I had put together, you better believe my wife is on there. <laughs> his, his human work, Paul's human resume. He says, first off, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Well, circumcision, we know, was, was the mark of the covenant. Uh, to, in order, if you were a Jewish boy, on the eighth day, you were circumcised. Now, we're not going to go into what circumcision is. Kids, if you don't know, go ask your parents later. Sorry, parents. Uh, Y'all might have to answer some interesting questions. But without circumcision, an Israelite could not be considered a part of the Jewish community. If you wanted to be considered part of the Jewish community, because the Jewish community is not just ethnic. It is ethnic and it is religious. And to truly be a part of the Jewish community, you had to, if you were a male, you had to have been circumcised. And it was to be done on the eighth day. Well, Paul says, I fulfilled that. Now, really what he should say is my parents fulfilled that. I don't think Paul had anything to do with it. But it was the initial event of becoming a member of God's people. Paul's way of saying, Paul's what he's saying is, from birth, I was taught to be obedient to God's commands. And so he says, from the very beginning of my life, I was taught to be obedient to God's commands. He can say, I've done it. Then he goes on, he says, well, I'm from the, the tribe of Benjamin. Well, the tribe of Benjamin is, a, is an interesting tribe. Uh, evidently, Benjamin was the only one of Jacob's sons to be born in the promised land was also the only tribe other than the tribe of Judah that truly stayed faithful to the Davidic dynasty after the split. Which is interesting because the very first king of Israel came from the tribe of Benjamin, but yet the tribe of Benjamin stayed faithful to the Davidic kingdom, or to the Davidic dynasty, even after that split. And so the tribe of Benjamin was, was well known. You can read a number of places. It talks about the warriors of Benjamin. They were very well known. They were famous. And so Paul is saying that, that I am from a leading tribe of Israel. And then he, he says, I am also I'm fully Hebrew. Now the term Hebrew of Hebrews can have a number of different meanings. One, it might mean that he was from a family that could trace its ancestry all the way back to the beginning of Israel on both sides of his parents. And that they had lived in the Holy Land. Now we know that Paul did not, was not born, his, his hometown was not in the Holy Land. It was in Tarsus. Uh, but he had spent time there. He had lived there. Uh, it also uh, could mean that he was not a Hellenist. Um, that he had, he had been fully immersed in Judaism from his birth. Hellenists, there were many among the Hebrews who were Jewish. They believed in the Jewish gods, but they had kind of taken all of these little things from the Greek culture around them and, and pulled them into their life. And so they spoke 
not Hebrew primarily, but they spoke Greek primarily. And so Paul is saying, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrew. I, I am so full of Hebrew that, that it just encompasses everything about me. Paul was trained by one of the most prominent rabbis among the Pharisees, a man named Gamaliel. He was very famous, very well known. You actually read his name in the gospel accounts. But as I was looking at that, it's this man, he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Isn't it interesting that God called a Hebrew of Hebrews to be his apostle to the Gentiles? And he says, I was a Pharisee. I was zealous for the law. There was no one that was more firmly committed to following God's law than the apostle Paul. The Pharisees were fanatical in their obedience to the commands of Moses. Uh, we know from, from other writings that, that the Pharisees, they even made up laws to build what they called a hedge of protection around the law. So they made up laws that they had to follow so that they wouldn't break, they didn't want to break that because if I broke this, it might lead to breaking the law, God's law itself. And so they, everything they did, was guarded by laws and, and they made so careful attention. And we see that throughout the Gospels. You know, they made so careful attention on, on tithing that they would count out their herb seeds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Tenth seed goes to God. I mean, can you imagine being so concerned with following God's law that when you go out to pick your garden, and you're picking the tomatoes, that you pick nine tomatoes and set them over here and say, I get to keep these. And then you pick the tenth tomato and you set it over here and say, this, this tomato belongs to God. I mean, that's the way that the Pharisees lived. But Paul says, I was among the most zealous of the Pharisees in obeying God's law. Then he says, and I went a notch above. He said he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He might say, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Not only did I make sure that I did everything possible to, to follow God's law, but I went to persecute those that I believed were not following God's law. I was a persecutor of the church. What we could say about Paul is this. If you could attain salvation by working God's law from the Old Testament, then Paul would be first in line. Everything about Paul's life was focused on following and being obedient to God's command, to his law. If you could attain salvation by the work you do, then Saul was at the front of the line. But he recognized something. In verses 7 through 14, Paul recognized the truth. And that truth was that his human resume was garbage. He set out all his human accomplishments, but Paul says, I want to set all those things aside. Uh, he uses a, a strong word that could be translated rubbish or garbage. Can you imagine saying about everything in my life is garbage? Everything that I have accomplished in life is garbage. What Paul is saying, the Apostle Paul is recognizing that all the work he did is meaningless. It's nothing. Paul says, my ancestry, my hard work, is worthless. He says it didn't even gain him a hint of God's pleasure, much less salvation. Paul says what really matters is this. I know Jesus Christ. Paul says what matters is not how good a Pharisee I was. What matters is not that I was from the tribe of Benjamin. What matters not is that I studied under the best, most famous Pharisee of them all. I'm not mad, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is that I know Jesus Christ. Everything else is worthless. It was far, far more 
than anything the Apostle Paul could do. I want to ask you, how much do you value knowing Jesus? How much do we value knowing Jesus Christ? He goes on to say, there's no self-righteousness. He said, I was faultless, blameless in keeping the law. Now, does, does Paul mean that he never sinned? Does, does Paul mean that he never got upset, never disobeyed his parents as a child? No, he doesn't mean that. What he means is that as far as he knew that he had done everything possible to live strictly according to the law, But he recognized that there is even a higher law. And that is the law of Jesus' righteousness. Do you know Jesus? And secondly, do you recognize your inability to live perfectly enough to win God's approval? Do you recognize your own inability to live perfect enough to win God's approval? Because you came to church this morning, you might be tempted to think that you are one of the more committed ones. And that that puts you in a special class in God's eyes. I'm going to tell you it doesn't. For those that, that chose to stay home today because of fears about the coronavirus, they are no less committed to Christ, no less loved by God than any of us that showed up today. Nothing we do can win God's approval because every single one of us are sinners. We were born sinners and we have been sinners for our whole lives. You know, I laugh sometimes when people say that, uh, that they believe in the, the goodness of humanity. And, you know, they, they have trouble with this thing of original sin. And I always just go, man, you have not spent much time around two or three year olds. <laughs> I mean, preschool teachers, you talk to a preschool teacher, they have no problem believing in the concept of original sin. Uh, they will look at you and say, oh, yes, those little devils come out devils. <laughs> Even when they're on your own, we recognize original sin. You know, I recognize it in my kids. And I know that my parents recognize it in me. Any sin, no matter how small we might consider it, disqualifies us from salvation. One time I was preaching in a, a church that I was at before. It was a day of a potluck. I didn't realize that when I wrote the sermon out and put this illustration in there. But I said, you know, any sin disqualifies us from salvation. And I said, even the sin of gluttony on the day we're having a potluck, and I make it worse. I said, folks, if you have eaten your lunch and you had uh, you had just enough, you didn't you didn't overeat, you didn't indulge yourself, you ate just enough, and it gets to the dessert table, and you walk up to the dessert table, and there's a plate of chocolate chip cookies. And now since I'm here, I'd say a plate of my mom's chocolate chip cookies. And you look at those chocolate chip cookies and you go, you know, eating one of those chocolate chip cookies is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. And so you grab the one chocolate chip cookie and you eat it. And something inside of you says, Grant, you should not eat a second. Because eating a second for you would be gluttony. And then I reach over and grab that second chocolate chip cookie. That is sin. And folks, it disqualifies us from salvation. Why? Because the God whom we serve is so holy, so perfect, that any blemish cannot be in His presence. And a blemish that we might think is minor as eating a second chocolate chip cookie when we know that it would be gluttony disqualifies us from being in his presence. And the Apostle Paul recognized that. 
He recognized that, that he had sinned in his life. And no matter all the great stuff that he had done, that it was garbage. And that he was disqualified from attaining salvation. Except for the righteousness based on faith in Jesus Christ. That is the only path to salvation. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Paul, for all his growing up years and his early adulthood years, had Paul had, had worked so hard to attain salvation. And then he recognized that he couldn't. Salvation is based on our confession of Jesus as Savior and Lord. And because of that, we are counted righteous in God's eyes. God takes your list of sin and he wipes it clean. Not because you earned it, but because Jesus paid the price. It is the free gift of salvation that you and I must accept as a gift. But I love this. Paul says, I didn't do anything to earn my salvation. Couldn't do anything to earn my salvation. But then he finishes this and he says, but I'm still working on my salvation. In verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this, all the stuff he just talked about, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul recognizes that he has not fully come to understand and participate in the, in the death of Jesus. He recognizes that Jesus has saved him. He recognizes that Jesus has has paid for his salvation. He recognizes that he is going to go to heaven. But Paul says, I recognize that. I have accepted the gift. But he says, I don't fully understand and live out everything about it. He says, I have so much more growing to do. And guys, this is the same man who wrote in your Bible, started Romans, and go to Hebrews, and people argue about whether he wrote Hebrews or not. I think probably Paul did not write Hebrews. So go to the beginning of Hebrews and put your, put your hand there. Everything between this Romans 1-1 to just before Hebrews 1-1, all of that was written by Paul. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's so inspired that we believe that every word he wrote there is true and accurate. This guy who wrote a major chunk of the Bible says, I do not fully understand everything. I don't fully live up to everything that I say, that everything God has taught me, and that I am still unworthy. If that guy recognizes his unworthiness, if that guy recognizes his need to continue to grow, then every single one of us ought to get down on our knees before God and say, God, I am not worthy. Father, I recognize that I don't deserve any of your love and your mercy, but thank you for giving it to me. And we ought to, every one of us, say, God, I do not know everything about your word. Help me to learn and understand more. I had another professor that came in one day and he told our class he was just beaming. He said, I read John 3.16 today. And a bunch of seminary students are looking at him going, cool. I read John 3.16. You want us to quote it to you? And he was like, yo, y'all don't understand. He said, I wrote my PhD dissertation on John chapter 3. And if you know anything about the guy that when you write a dissertation on a subject, he likes to be the foremost expert on that subject. He's supposed to know everything there is to know about it. He said, I did my quiet time in John chapter 3 today. All right. Great. He said, it was amazing. <clears throat> We're just kind of looking at each other. And he goes, what hit me today was that my five-year-old son can fully and completely explain to you the meaning, the message of John 3.16. He 
we're like, yeah, we could have probably done that at five too. And he said, I don't fully and, under, fully and completely understand the message of John 3.16. I don't fully understand the depth of God's love to me. He said, that is the amazing thing about God's word. It is so simple that a child can understand. It is so complex that I will never plumb the depths of it. Paul is saying that in this passage. God's love for us is so simple that the most simple-minded can hear it and can understand it and can be obedient to it and can be saved. But he says at the same time, it is so full of depth, so full of truth that I haven't fully understood it yet. Which resume do you live out do you live your God-focused resume? Or do you live your human-focused resume? Live up to the name of Christian. Trusting in God for your salvation. If you're here today and you have never trusted God, if you have never come to that place where you admitted, that, God, I can't do it. I've tried. I tried to be the best. I worked hard. I, I was a Texan of Texans, a Southern Baptist of Southern Baptists. I studied under the best names. I went to the right schools, the right colleges, whatever. I, I tried it all. I, I obeyed my mom to the letter. And then you recognize that it still doesn't give me the assurance that I know Jesus Christ and that I have true salvation. If that is you today, then today is the day to give it up. Today is the day to say, I can't do it on my own. And I need Jesus Christ to live in me and to bring me salvation. In just a minute, we're going to be singing. I'm going to be standing here at the front. I encourage you, if you've never come to that place, today, make today the day that you hand over and you say, I've been living and and trusting in my human focused resume all the good stuff that I did and I want, today I want to set it aside and I want to trust in God I want to trust in God's resume for my life because his resume for you life for your life has one big word written across it Jesus there may be others here today that say you know I've trusted Christ but I have committed that sin of thinking maybe I know enough. Maybe I'm good enough. But I recognize that just like Paul, there's still more I can know about God. There's still more that I can experience of His love and His purpose in my life. And I want to invite you to come and, and talk with me or John. Pray with us. Whatever it is that God is calling on you to do, say yes to Him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your gracious love. Father, we thank you that even though we are not worthy, we don't deserve what Jesus did for us, that he did it anyway. So Father, we today want to lay aside our pride, our accomplishments, and come to you as one who recognizes that it is all garbage compared to the surpassing love shown to us by you through your son Jesus. May we throw our, our lives at your feet and ask you to take them. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Come as God leads.